It's time for Hollywood and history. Let me begin by saying, the fact that you're watching this makes it all worth it. For me, this leg of life's journey began in September of 2017. I was in Glendale, California, in this building. Now, Glendale wasn't unfamiliar to me. Anyone who knows show business in Los Angeles knows Glendale is also Hollywood. To be fair, all of LA is technically Hollywood, but I had worked for a TV production company for years directly across the street. But this was my first time entering that building. I sat in an office and had a two hour conversation that changed the course of my life. I heard the words, Armenian Genocide Movie. For the first time, little did I know that in a few short weeks I would meet a new friend whom I now call my historian, or my adopted little brother, depending on the context. He is also my partner and co-host of this show. Welcome to Hollywood and History. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Michael, and this is Armin. Say hello, Armin. Hello, Armin. <laughs> Perfect. Armin and I come from two very different worlds. For the past almost two decades, I've been working in Hollywood, behind the scenes, in post-production and producing. I do a little writing on the side, too. But uh, Armin here has been focused on something very different. Armin, what have you been up to for the past 15 to 20 years? It's mainly going to school. Going to school. Come on. The name of the show is Hollywood and History. So be more specific. What have you been doing for the past 10 years of your life? Uh, reading a lot of books and studying history and trying to get a better handle of the past and how it affects the present. All right. He's a historian. Let me just, you know, that's the, that's the historian way of saying, yeah, I'm a historian. All right. So if you'll notice, we are doing this from scratch here. We have technical hurdles that we are going to be overcoming. Armin is uh, on a Zoom call right now. At some point, you know, when this, I don't know, the lockdown lifts and he comes back from the East Coast, we'll do some of these shows together in person. But right now it's Zoom calling. And my connection here in this small studio, this is the only place I could build my studio. It also has a pretty awful Wi-Fi connection. So poor Armin has to try and decipher what I'm saying as my voice breaks up, but also the video quality of him. Sometimes he'll stutter and break up, but I may have to ask you to repeat yourself, Armin, sometimes, but uh, we're going we're gonna to muscle through this. There it is. Hollywood in history. Welcome to the show. Without further ado, I'm going to ask you some questions, Armin. In this first episode of the show, I want to start at the logical place at the beginning. I want to talk about how Armin and I first met. I also want to talk about what's significant about this day in history. But first, I'm going to put you on the spot, Armin. Are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> all right. I know you spend your time, in case you're all wondering, I'm looking at my notes. I got my notes right here. So hopefully the microphone will pick that up. Rustling paper, sound design. Reading from my notes, my, my show prep notes. I know you spend all your time in books, learning about people and events from the past, but I want to hear what you have to say about what's happening in the world today. I know this show's not about current events, and I want to steer clear of all kinds of different topics, but I like to say we are riding the front edge of history, right? Every moment, every second, things are happening in the world. So we're we're right on the front edge of history. It's unfolding right now. And as a historian, typically you're reading things from the past. But at you as a historian, I'm sure every now and then you come up for air from whatever you're reading and researching and you look at the world around you and realize, oh wait, I am in history. I'm in the middle of history. As we launch this show, we're going to be talking about events from a long time ago, but there's stuff happening all around us today that you know, we probably shouldn't ignore. If there's anything applicable from your knowledge of history to what's going on today, give us a word of wisdom. Well, I always feel like whenever we're e we are in the present moment, it still requires us, um, you know, we immediately recall similarities or parallels of things that we've read in the past. But I always feel that it's useful to have a, a little bit of distance to 
take in and appreciate the, the moment you're living in. And I know I'm speaking in very general terms, but what you asked me even reminds me of this quote by a very well-known Communist uh, Party Chinese official from the 1960s when his name was Xu Enlai. And the, the time they asked him what was the impact of the French Revolution of 1789, I mean, he said, still too early to tell. So perhaps <laughs> uh, you know, we are living in a, a moment where there is political instability in the United States and Europe and um, this global pandemic immediately when it uh, broke out, I wanted to go back into the history books and see what did we learn from the Spanish influenza in 1918, 1919. And you can draw some lessons from it, but also understand there's maybe limited purchase to how much you can learn and you have to take present circumstances into account. That was really good. Just, I, I want another take on it. This is a quick commercial break from me. I needed to step out of my cramped little studio to record this important message. If you want to support this program, this show, whatever it is we're doing, Armin and I here, uh, there's a lot more to come, but the only way we can do it is by getting your support. There's a number of ways you can support us. There is a GoFundMe campaign. Any amount helps. You can donate anonymously if you don't want your name associated with this content. But uh, other ways you can help, probably the best way aside from financing us to help is by a word of mouth campaign. Pass this video along, share the link in an email or a text. Um, you can also subscribe, click the notification bell, like it, comment. Those are all helpful ways, but most importantly, share this message. Just repeat that part again, it was really good. So Xu Lai, who was a very well-known Chinese Communist Party official in the 1960s was asked what was the impact of the French Revolution of 1789, and he answered, it's still too early to tell. <laughs> that's, that's a good line. I mean, it's still too early to tell. We'll, we'll see how these things work out. You know, what is the line that uh, history is written by the winners? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, you definitely come across that so, so many times where it becomes a, a, a cliche, but when they do say that history is written by the victors but of course that's not always necessarily the case right and I'm glad you say that because history is still recorded it doesn't necessarily favor the victors it's just the victors for a period of time get to write their version of it does that make sense I mean I think the presumption behind that quote is a state or whoever it is who has the means to record history or to uh, document the way that a certain event or a certain era unfolded uh, is able to control the means and is able to silence others who may offer a different narrative. And of course, you can look back in history, especially in the 20th century, to see so many states being able to monopolize that kind of information and channel it in the direction of empowering the the state that they are trying to build. Got it. That's All the right. way, best way of distilling the quote. Yep, that's good. That's a very good distilling of the quote. Um, and a total tangent from the subject matter that we're supposed to cover in this first episode. All right, so this day in history, Armin, what happened 99 years ago today? So until 10 minutes ago, it hadn't even dawned on me that, uh, you know, it was June 3rd, so about a century ago was when a sensational trial was held in Berlin, Germany, just a few years after the end of the First World War. And an individual who had committed a, some would say, brazen act of murder on the streets of uh, Berlin was acquitted by a, a jury, not found guilty. And what was the response in the courtroom? Well, most people seem to applaud and were uh, jubilant about this individual's uh, acquittal. All right, good. We're going to go into more detail on this, but uh, I w that was kind of putting you on the spot as well, seeing if you remember the significance of June 3rd. I didn't, I didn't launch this show on June 3rd for, you know, oh, that's a good day. Pick it out randomly on the calendar. I was looking at this date I'm like I gotta, I gotta get this show off the ground by that date because it's a, it's a significant day in history. 
especially for you and I and our friendship, our relationship. It's, you know, Hollywood and history uh, need to start off on, on a good, you know, momentous day. Just like the, the channel, um, the Tales of Truth channel where this is being exhibited, uh, where it's being posted, aired. I launched that on a, another very significant day, April 24th. We'll get into all of that. Yes, this this show will focus on the Armenian Genocide, and in particular, Sogomon Talirian, a hero who arose from that atrocity. But I want to keep moving. We'll get back to more details of that trial of what happened 99 years ago today. But I want to move on to my next question. Armin, I want your side of the story of how you and I first met. Yeah, no, I definitely remember that day quite well, Michael. It was in November 2017, and I went to my one of my favorite bookstores in my hometown in Glendale, California. And right as I walked in, I saw there was somebody who was sitting on a stool in my favorite section of the bookstore, uh, the history section, of course, and not wanting to make a fuss about it, I just circled around and went to talk to the owner who I'm on very good terms with and he was able to find the book that I was looking for and right as he was ringing me up at the register he says oh by the way do you know Michael and he pointed to you who was the the gentleman who was sitting in the stool very inconveniently blocking everybody from uh, passing so I of course, had never met you before, but that was our first encounter. Yes. So, now be honest with me. You walked in, and there's a guy blocking the aisle, sitting on a stool, as you already mentioned, your favorite section of the bookstore. Were you a little annoyed? Yeah, I mean, I did ask myself, who does that? I did think it was pretty inconsiderate for a person to just hog that entire space, especially since all I wanted to do was just pick the book that I was looking for and um, be on my way. So, in other words, I made a bad first impression. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, did not, you did not endear yourself to me the, by doing that. <laughs> so that was Armin's side of the story. Here's my side of the story. I had been working in Hollywood for a while. This is 2017. And I saw that uh, I needed a career change, not out, out of Hollywood, but I had been working for someone else and I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to find a story that I could tell uh, that would be compelling and interesting and would benefit society. Something that would build up people rather than tear them down, not just to entertain. I want to make a contribution to the world. You know, that's my life's goal is to do something to, to help society rather than harm it. And I had been pointed in the direction of the Armenian genocide. Uh, someone had told me um, there's got to be some kind of hero story out of that horrible, horrible thing that happened. There must be uh, an Armenian in Geronimo. So, I, you know, being a journalist by profession, I mean, working for a news program, I, you know, did the logical thing. I started researching. I went to bookstores that would tell me what I needed to know. And I found one in Glendale, California. And I had visited a couple of times and I had purchased a few books and I had started reading. And I went in one day and found out that there was this hero Actually, I'd already purchased uh, a book about the court trial and read that. And then I went back in after I found out this hero in the court trial had written his own memoir. And the bookstore owner said, yeah, yeah, he did. And I'm like, great, great. Do you have it? He's like, well, I don't. But even if I did, you can't read it. It's never been translated into English. So what that told me is, here's this incredible story that the hero told his own side of the story. That's the best case scenario. The downside is I can't read it myself. So I pulled up a stool kind of in, 
little bit of desperation and not knowing what else to do. And I just sat down in the middle of the aisle and just started looking through books. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the front door of the store open. I there's somebody walks in. I kind of they go around me. I don't even know. I don't know if you went to another aisle or not, not knowing that this person who had just walked into the, into the store would become one of my closest friends, Armin Manuk Kaloyan. Um, so, not to get mushy, but the fact of the matter is, he comes out. Uh, he he passed me in the aisle and goes and talks to the bookstore owner. The bookstore owner comes out a few moments later with Armin standing next to him and says, hey, you know, you, you're talking about making a movie about this guy, Sogol and Tellurian. Well, this guy uh, might be able to help you. And I didn't know that I needed a historian. Duh. Like, you know, me, the investigative journalist. I, I didn't know I needed a historian. I was just going to do all this myself. I was going to plunge into all these books and figure out this entire history uh, myself to tell the story. Yeah, right. So it turns out you were available. I just remember distinctly saying to you, huh, well, I think I'm supposed to make a movie or write a script about this guy, but he's, you know, his, his story, his memoir hasn't been translated into English. And I'm just going to, I'm going to be researching and I, I need a historian. I need somebody who knows all this stuff, that, you know, can, you know, give me, give me the answers that I need. Are you available? Can you help me? And your answer was? Sure. Why not? Yep. Almost exactly like that. Sure. Why not? And that's ex ex exactly. So after being annoyed with me and walking around, we meet in the bookstore. I ask for your help to make a movie about Sogamun Tellurian. What were your thoughts? Here's a quick commercial, don't go away. I mentioned earlier the GoFundMe campaign. It's linked in the description below this video. You, or you could just go to GoFundMe and search for Tales of Truth Channel Fund. If I'm gonna work on this project full time, that's the only way I can do it. It's a goal of $70,000 by the end of the year. There really are no end dates on GoFundMes, but if I can raise $70,000 by December 31st of this year, I can continue doing this project full time. The production value will go up, more and more content. I'm sitting on tons of captivating, enthralling stuff, but uh, I got to pay my bills as well. So um, I'll leave that up to you. Go fund me. And back into the studio for the rest of the show. I mean, I think the, in my mind, I was just very skeptical about the, the whole notion of the project because I'm, I'm very familiar with Tellurian's story and also familiar that many had also tried to make films about his life and what he did. And I thought that the most realistic answer would be best for you. So I, if I recall correctly, I think I gave you maybe five or six books dealing with the subject of the Armenian genocide with the First World War and that entire period and told you, you know, start reading these books and then you can come back to me once, in my mind at least, I thought that once you've made sufficient progress, we can talk about what our next steps would be. But I mean, I, I would be lying if I said that I wasn't just a little skeptical from the, the beginning. Yeah, here's some total random stranger asking me if I can help him make uh, a, a movie about Sogol and Tellurian. Yeah, I get it. I mean, that's the nature of Hollywood. Like there's always people, you know, <laughs> looking for stories and talking the big talk and saying, you know, you know, let's do this. Yeah, let's do it. It's going. It's great. And, you know, that's actually part of the grind of Hollywood. You, you have to push a project forward. And the vast majority of Hollywood projects go nowhere. This one, however, uh, seemed to have gotten some legs. There's a lot of stuff that's happened in the last two and a half years. And that's what this show's really about. Let's say this show is about the documentation of the research and development of the Sogamun Tellurian story. Let's talk a little bit more about that trial before we wrap up this 
this episode. We meet in the bookstore. I'm at my wits end because I don't speak Armenian. I don't read Armenian. And lo and behold, you walk in and it's like you materialized out of heaven right in front of me. I didn't know I needed you, but you showed up right when I needed you, like literally at the perfect moment. It's like, poof, here he is. You need a historian, you need an Armenian speaker, you need somebody who knows everything about Ottoman and World War I history, not everything, but an expert on World War I and the Ottoman Empire and Sogomon Tellurian and Armenian genocide. And it's like, you know, my, my encyclopedia walked in the door and materialized right in front of me. Um, so I didn't know the full ramifications of what I was getting into and you did, and you are, uh, I want you to just elaborate a little bit about the significance of the trial, uh, of what so Solomon Tellurian did and the results of his actions. Yeah, so because this was such a sensational trial, there were many international observers and students of law who were following closely what was taking place. And this period saw many political trials. And when I talk about the period, really the era stretching from the early 1900s to the, the interwar period in the 1920s. So there was no shortage of political trials. But what was significant about the verdict in Tellurian's case was the man who would go to coin the very word genocide, Rafael Lemkin, was a law student in Poland at the time. And when he approached his law professor about what had happened, his professor told him that the individual who had ordered the, the destruction of the Armenians during the war was in essence or could be compared to a pig farmer. So if a pig farmer has, you know, um, several pigs and he decides to slaughter them, you know, that's part of his, uh, you know, uh, that's his prerogative. He, he's allowed to do it. And Lemkin would just recoiled in horror from hearing that comparison because he could not stand the, I, the notion of, you know, comparing pigs to human beings and thinking that just because this massacre uh, took place in the Ottoman Empire, then really nobody had any could say anything about or judge the, the individuals who ordered the destruction. And, you know, 20 years later, once the, the Holocaust uh, came around, Lemkin himself would be personally impacted by the deaths of dozens of his family members. And that would galvanize him to push uh, forward uh, the legal notion of genocide as something which should be banned in uh, wherever it's, you know, wherever it took place or was practiced around the world. And this was right after the Second World War. And so technically you could say the word genocide, which Raphael Lemkin coined, is a result of this trial because he saw genocide for the first time. It, 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 there was no word for it. He saw these, these atrocities happening through that trial and it affected him in such a way that 20 only 20 years later when the same thing happens again he's pushing to have have it have a name for it so the world can identify this thing that's that's never really been seen right i mean it definitely was an inspiration once he decided to create this uh create this term and genocide comes from a uh, mixed Greek and Latin uh, etymology so genos meaning people and side in Latin meaning killing so even before this term was invented when the massacre or the genocide of Darmians was taking place you had many observers who would just use any word that they could substitute for what was taking place right before their very eyes, but they didn't exactly, uh, they literally did not have the words to describe it. So the American ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Henry Morgenthau, called it race murder, whereas 
German or Austro-Hungarian observers in the Ottoman Empire also just were forced to use words in, in its more biblical uh, context, but still trying to convey the, the scale of it in ways that were impossible at the time. What was the word you said in its biblical context? Holocaust. Um, oh, they used that in the for the Armenian Genocide? In the Armenian Genocide and even 15, 20 years earlier when other massacres were taking place against the Armenians in the late 1890s, you had the usage of that term, which I think is meant to, and, and that has, the uh, Holocaust is also a, a Greek word, but it also harkens back to this biblical um, imagery or recalls that kind of imagery. Got it. And so before we wrap up this episode, I want to ask you about someone we're going to have, we're going to feature in episode two coming up next week, next Wednesday. The show is every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on Tales of Truth. So next Wednesday, I want to have a, a, a movie producer, some, some interview bites from a movie producer, a guy named Ralph Winter. You've probably seen some of his movies. He's produced movies like X-Men, uh, like four of them. Like he started on, like he, he was telling me about how he pitched X-Men and, and, and then it, it turned into this huge franchise and he stayed working on those for a while. And then he also produced a film called The Promise. Um, what were your impressions briefly? Cause this is a tease for next week, Armin. What were your, what was your impression of Ralph Winter when you met him? Ralph Winter was really the first Hollywood producer or, uh, you know, somebody with that kind of renown that I'd ever uh, met in in my life, or he was the first person who I met uh, who came from that background, really. And he was a, uh, you know, such a humble character and... All right, all right, that's enough. I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to cut you off. Just by how... Ah, no, I'm going to stop you. Missed. I'm going to uh, stop you, okay? That All that stuff you're saying right there, that, if you want to hear what Armin has to think about Ralph Winter, come back next week, all right? All right, signing off. Episode one of Hollywood and History is in the can. Say bye, Armin. Bye. I'm afraid we're out of time for episode one. Come back next week when I talk about when I first met Ralph Winter, Armin will talk a little bit more about his impressions of Ralph Winter, and we'll talk, we'll go more into depth about the Sogomon Tellurian story. Bye, everybody. This is the end credit sequence. I'm just out for a walk. You can click away now. Oh, I'm gonna fill this side of the screen with some stuff right here, over here on the side of the screen. There's gonna be some, some words and stuff that come up right now that are actually already up. So, you know. It's an end credit sequence. I can do whatever I want. I can take a walk through this gorgeous neighborhood. All right, all right. Enough from me. Come back next week, Wednesday at 6 p.m.